Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. On today's program. You will hear stories from Dan Friedel and Katie Weaver. Later, Brian Lynn presents this week's technology report. We close the show with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here is Dan Friedel. For the first time, a new process that uses the genetic material. Of three people has resulted in the birth of several babies in Britain. The experimental process has been used before in Mexico and the United States. Britain's fertility regulator said Wednesday that the parents used a process, which was approved with some restrictions in 2015. The story was first reported by the Guardian newspaper. Britain's Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority said only that fewer than five babies were born as a result of the process. The treatment is supposed to prevent the babies from inheriting rare genetic diseases. The treatment of combining DNA from a mother, father, and an egg donor is supposed to help women who have a genetic problem that can be passed to their babies. The problem is in the mitochondria of some women. Mitochondria are parts of some cells in the body that provide energy. However, scientists say. The mitochondria in some women can pass genetic problems on to their babies. The genetic defects can cause muscular dystrophy, epilepsy, heart problems, and intellectual disabilities. Experts say the genetic problems affect about one in two hundred children born in Britain. So far, thirty-two patients. Have been given permission to receive the treatment. The process involves doctors taking genetic material from the mother's egg, and then adding it to a donor's egg. The donor's egg has healthy mitochondria, but doctors remove the rest of its important DNA. Doctors fertilize the new egg, so it becomes an embryo, and they put it into the mother's womb. Scientists say using this process results in the new embryo having less than one percent of the genetic material from the egg's donor. Scientists at England's Newcastle University supervised the treatment. The Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority said Tuesday that it was still early days of the treatment. But the government body said it hoped the doctors and scientists who worked on the treatment would soon publish more information. I'm Dan Friedel. A petit basse griffon vendéant, or PBGV. Won top prize at the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show in New York City Tuesday. The dog, called Buddy Holly, won the award for best in show. The breed he represents is known for its rabbit hunting ability. Buddy Holly defeated six other candidates. To take the prize at the most famous dog show in the United States, this year's event 
was held at the USTA Billie Jean King National Tennis Center in New York. I never thought a PBGV would do this, handler and co-owner Janice Hayes said. Buddy Holly is the epitome of a show dog. Nothing bothers him. His competitors included Rummy, a Pekingese that came in second. His owner and handler, David Fitzpatrick, breeds the small dogs. Rummy is, in Fitzpatrick's words, true to Pekingese type. Lots of carriage, presence, everything in one here. Winston, the French bulldog, was also seeking the best-in-show prize after coming close last year. An Australian shepherd named Ribbon, an English setter called Cider, a giant schnauzer named Monty, and an American Staffordshire terrier called Trouble also were in the final group of competitors. If Buddy Holly was feeling the pressure, he did not show it ahead of the finals. He spent the late day playing with his people and rejecting any proposal that he take a rest before the final competition. He just screams PBGV, Hayes said, noting that the breed is independent and full of fun. Their goal is to make you laugh every day, she said. The breed began in France. The American Kennel Club says the small hounds are the 154th most common purebreds in the U.S. Buddy Holly has also lived and competed in Britain, Ireland, and Australia. I'm Katie Weaver. Several measures are being considered by the U.S. Congress to regulate technology companies in an effort to protect the public. Many American lawmakers have been critical of technology business operations and social media services. There is support among lawmakers to pass federal legislation to make additional rules for technology companies and for their business activities. Some U.S. states have already passed their own laws restricting the use of online services by young users. But there is still a lot of disagreement in Congress over what kinds of laws to pass. Tech companies have so far resisted federal efforts to regulate their business activities. This opposition has also made passing any new rules or guidelines more difficult. Here are some of the possible ways that Congress is considering new regulations for technology companies. Several House and Senate bills are meant to make online services safer for children. Lawmakers have described many examples of teenagers who have taken their own lives after being bullied online. They have also pointed to the deaths of young people who copied dangerous behaviors publicized on social media. In the Senate, there are at least two competing bills on children's online safety. One would require social media companies to be more open about their operations and enable child safety settings by default. In addition, young users would have the ability to turn off tools designed to get them to spend more time online. Senators proposing these rules have said the services should be safe by design. The legislation also aims to prevent some dangers to minors including online restrictions on subjects like eating disorders, 
Other dangerous behaviors include suicide, substance abuse, sexual exploitation, and other illegal activities. Another Senate bill is designed to expand child privacy protections online. The measure could ban companies from collecting personal data from younger teenagers. It would also ban targeting children and teens with advertising. A measure in the House would attempt to give adults and children more control over their data. And another bill that gained wide support last year would try to limit data collection and make it illegal to target advertisements to children. Lawmakers have introduced a series of bills to either ban the video sharing service TikTok or make it easier to ban it. During a hearing on March 23rd, Lawmakers from both parties expressed their concerns about the video sharing service to TikTok chief Xu Zichu. The criticism centered on the company's ties to China's communist government, data security, and harmful content on the service. Chu defended TikTok, saying the company takes user safety and privacy seriously. He said the company does not permit itself to be influenced by the Chinese government. After the hearing, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley, a Republican Party member, tried to force a Senate vote on legislation that would ban TikTok from operating in the U.S. But he was blocked by another Republican, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul. Paul argued that such a ban would violate the U.S. Constitution and anger millions who use the app. Another bill supported by Republican Senator Marco Rubio of Florida would ban U.S. economic dealings with TikTok, but it would also enable the U.S. president to block online services. The government considers hostile to the U.S. There has also been much debate in Congress about whether there is a need to place limits on artificial intelligence or AI. The Democratic Party's Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has been working with AI experts. He released some guidelines for what AI regulation could look like. These include increased openness about the people and data involved in developing the technology. Schumer has said he thinks any legislative measures should prevent possible catastrophic damage to our country. At the same time, he has stated his desire. To make sure the U.S. is able to lead in this transformative technology, the administration of President Joe Biden recently announced a spending measure worth $140 million to establish seven new AI research centers. And Vice President Kamala Harris met recently with the heads of Google. Microsoft and other companies to discuss the development of AI products. I'm Brian Lin. Brian Lin joins me now to talk more about this week's technology report. Thanks for being here, Brian. Of course, Ashley. Thanks for having me. This week's report dealt with proposals. In the U.S. Congress, seeking to regulate technology companies, how close are some of these proposals to actually getting passed into law? There have already been numerous congressional hearings with heads of technology companies, and lawmakers from both major parties have made clear they plan to hold tech companies more accountable for their business activities. But the problem, as noted in the report, 
is that so far it has been very difficult to reach agreement on any of the proposals. What are some of the reasons for that? One of the main reasons is that there have been major disagreements over how far the government should go in restricting tech companies and their products. There have been serious concerns, for example, that some legislation aimed at limiting some kinds of content may violate free speech protections. And the tech companies, too, have strongly lobbied against regulative efforts, and that has also slowed progress. Okay, well, thanks again for answering those questions, Brian, and thanks for being here. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. Welcome to the Making of a Nation American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. Britain was once the most powerful nation in the world. It ruled a far reaching empire. We look at how British power gave way to American influence after World War II. One can almost name the day when this happened. It was February 21st, 1947. British diplomats in Washington called the State Department. They had two messages from their government. The first was about Greece. The situation there was critical. Greece had been occupied by Germany during the war. Now it was split by a bitter civil war. On one side of the fighting was the Greek royal family supported by Britain. On the other side were communist-led rebels supported by Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union. British forces had helped keep Greece from becoming communist at the end of World War II. A few years later, Britain could no longer help. It needed all its strength to rebuild after the war. So on that February day in 1947, Britain told the United States it would soon end all support for Greece. Britain's second message that day was about Turkey. Turkey was stronger than Greece, but the concern was that it too could become communist unless it received outside help. Britain warned the United States that the Soviet Union would soon extend its control all the way across Eastern Europe to the Eastern Mediterranean. It called on President Harry Truman to provide strong American support to help Greece and Turkey resist the communist threat. Britain, in effect, was asking the United States to take over leadership of the Western world. The United States was ready to accept this new responsibility. For months, relations between the United States and the Soviet Union had been growing worse and worse. The two countries had fought together as allies in the Second World War. But Soviet actions after the war shocked the American people. The Soviet Union wanted to block Western political and economic influence in Central and Eastern Europe. It wanted to extend its own influence instead. So after the war, it forced a number of countries to establish communist governments. Britain's Prime Minister Winston Churchill described the situation in a speech in March of 1946 at Westminster College in the American state of Missouri. Churchill warned that the Soviet Union was trying to expand its power. He described it as an iron curtain falling across the middle of Europe. This iron curtain divided Europe into a communist East and a democratic West. The situation was made even more tense by news coming from China. China was a divided nation at the end of World War II. The forces of nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek controlled the southwestern part of the country. Communist forces under Mao Zedong controlled the north. 
both the United States and the Soviet Union expected that Chiang Kai-shek would be able to unite China. Chiang and the nationalists won several early victories over the communists. But Mao and his forces used a growing hatred of the nationalist government to win support. Slowly, they began to win battles and capture arms. Early in 1949, communist forces took control of Peking, now Beijing, and Tianjin. They captured Shanghai and Canton. By the end of the year, Chiang and his nationalist forces had to flee to the island of Taiwan. The fall of the nationalist government on the mainland caused a bitter political debate in America. Some critics of the Truman administration thought the United States had not done enough to help the nationalists. The Truman administration rejected the charges. It said Chiang caused his own defeat by failing to reform and win the support of the Chinese people. Secretary of State Dean Acheson described the defeat this way. The unfortunate but inescapable fact is that the ominous result of the civil war in China was beyond the control of the government of the United States. Nothing that this country did or could have done within the reasonable limits of its capabilities could have changed that result. Nothing that was left undone by this country has contributed to it. It was the product of internal Chinese forces, forces which this country tried to influence but could not. A decision was arrived at within China, if only a decision by default. The United States was more successful in its policies toward Europe. The British warnings about the communist threat in Greece and Turkey led President Truman to speak to Congress. He said, I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. Truman called on Congress to give him $400 million in aid for Greece and Turkey. After a brief but intense national debate, Congress agreed. Truman then launched an effort to save the Greek economy and reorganize the Greek army. Soon after that, Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union ended their aid to Greek rebels. The civil war in Greece ended. American help for Greece and Turkey was the first step in what became known as the Truman Doctrine. The goal of this policy was to stop Soviet aggression anywhere in the world. Truman was willing to use military force to stop the spread of communism, but he also believed it was equally important to build up Western European nations so they would be strong enough to defend themselves. Europe was suffering terribly after World War II. There were severe shortages of food and fuel. Crops were destroyed. Many Europeans were beginning to look to the communists, to anybody, to save them. This is one reason why Truman and his advisors developed a plan to rebuild the economies of Europe. After the war, President Truman made George Marshall his Secretary of State. Marshall had led American troops as a general in World War II. Now, as the nation's top diplomat, he proposed the idea for rebuilding Europe. This idea became known as the Marshall Plan. 
President Truman explained why there had to be a Marshall Plan. People were starving, he said. There had been food riots in France and Italy. There was not enough fuel. People were cold and sick. Tuberculosis was breaking out. As Truman said later, something had to be done. Secretary of State Marshall described the plan during a congressional hearing in Washington. Why must the United States carry so great a load in helping Europe? The answer is simple. The United States is the only country in the world today which has the economic power and productivity to furnish the needed assistance. The six and eight tenth billion proposed for the first 15 months is less than a single month's charge of the war. To be quite clear, this unprecedented endeavor of the new world to help the old is neither sure nor easy. It is a calculated risk. It is a difficult program. And you know far better than I do the political difficulties involved in this program. But there's no doubt whatever in my mind that if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. And there's also no doubt in my mind that the whole world hangs in the balance as to what it is to be. The United States offered aid through the Marshall Plan to all countries in Europe. The Soviet Union and its allies refused help. Sixteen other countries, however, welcomed the aid. From 1948 to 1952, administrators of the Marshall Plan worked with these countries. The United States spent $13 billion. The plan worked. Agricultural production in Marshall Plan countries increased by 10%. Industrial production increased by 35%. Production in some industries, such as steel, increased by much more. There were political results as well. Stronger economies helped prevent communists from gaining control of the governments in France and Italy. Some Europeans criticized the Marshall Plan. They said it increased tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union in the years after the war. Yet few could deny that the plan was one of the most successful international economic programs in history. <laughs>